Well, I started in television in Chicago in 1939 on W9XYZ, Zenith Experimental Station. 1939? Mm-hmm. You weren't playing a test pattern or anything at that time? No, as a matter of fact, I was hosting and playing the leading man on a series of 45-minute dramatic shows. And if I may say so, this was pure hell. Huh. There was no air conditioning. It was a very small room, maybe twice the size of this room we're in. It must have been 140 degrees. I was a thin young man, and I lost eight pounds on the first show. I had oh. to host the thing in tails, mm. and then with no incidental music, no way to segue out of one scene into another, I hosted the thing and crawled out of one scene, undressing and getting into a business suit uh -huh. from tails, and came right into the scene as the lead in the show, you know. Well, 45 minutes of that, boy, I'm telling you, I was worn to a frazzle, and this went on for a few weeks, and uh, that was enough of that. It must have um, been one of the very first dramatic things ever on television, yeah. period, let alone Chicago. I suppose, I really don't know, but 39 was pretty young mm -hmm. for you know, television. Chicago and Zenith never got together as far as television is concerned. Is that so? No, there was never a... Zenith was trying to do a little bit with the Phonovision thing there uh -huh. back in the mm -hmm. early 50s, mm -hmm. but it never got off the ground, and okay. we never did get a Zenith-owned TV station. Be, you never heard of W9XYZ? I don't remember. Course, that was call an experimental letters, call letter yes. thing. You know. yeah. The first two TV stations Chicago had were WBKB, hmm. that was owned by Balbin and Katz Corporation, oh, yeah, and sure. then uh, WGN TV, uh -huh. which you know was owned by the Tribune and all yeah. that sort of thing. WGN, world's greatest newspaper. Right. At 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time, on NBC's WEAF, The Bob Crosby Show took to the air in New York with the just-heard Les Tremaine as co-host and Shirley Mitchell as the special guest. This episode's rating was 13.8. Say, hey, it's Bob Crosby. <laughs> The Bob Crosby Show, rebroadcast for the American Armed Forces and their allies with the Bobcats, the Pied Pipers, Bob's special guest, and Les Tremaine. And here with the Bobcats and the Pied Pipers is Bob Crosby. Earlier that evening, Shirley Mitchell played Leela Ransom on NBC's The Great Gildersleeve. I would occasionally have four shows a day. Some would be at CBS. There were times when the artist entrance was too far for me to run through, they'd have a special page holding a door because the timing was so awful. I mean, it was maybe five minutes apart to get from CBS to NBC. And then they would hold a special door. running down Sunset Boulevard. Then, running right? down Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> well, they would let me park usually at a spot. And sometimes I would run and cut through the back way. The page would have the door open. I'd get in, somebody would hand me a script with cuts in it. You always had cuts because the timing was done mm -hmm. at the last minute. And I'd go on the air because I also then began to do on Sunday afternoons the Colgate Comedy Hour. Les Tremaine and I did that for a mm -hmm. couple of seasons with Bob Crosby. I would do that and Gildersleeve. Fibber was on a Tuesday. I would occasionally do Fibber on a Tuesday and then the Jack Carson show on a Tuesday. Then there was Joan Davis and Rudy Valley in between all of that. And, and I, all the stuff was going on at the same time. At NBC and CBS, it was such an exciting time. Fans would be lined up for a block maybe, all the way around waiting to get in. They'd let them in a half hour before the show. And at the artist entrance, you had the same fans every day who, mm -hmm. you know, they grew up. I mean, I met one lady in Hughes recently shopping and she said, do you remember me? <laughs> she recognized me because I've done quite a bit of television. But it was the most glorious time. Virtually everyone we've spoken to has said the same thing. It was really the best of times. Incredible. Even Incredible. people who have certainly gone into even greater success in television. Right. They've always said it was so great because, first of all, you didn't have to deal with the That's makeup right. and That's the costumes right. and all of that, even though you did dress uh, oh, we for dressed. a nighttime sure, show. Oh, we dressed, sure, sure. And we were a family. Mm -hmm. We still are very, very close. Janet Waldo and I are very close friends, Ginny, Greg, Alvia Allman. Mm -hmm. It was a nucleus of people that you never grew away from, and they were dear, wonderful people. In television, you know, you do a show, you never see anybody again. She's playing one of her many character roles tonight. She's just going to be a character. Strut out here, Shirley, and slam a salam at the guys and the gals, huh? Oh, Bob, I 
can't wait another second to ask you all about your new baby. How did the little darling sleep last night? Are you kidding? Most of the night he cried. Oh, well, why didn't you sing to him? What do you think made him cry? <laughs> can you imitate a baby voice, Shirley? Oh, I don't know if I can or not, but I'll try. <laughs> hmm, loud baby. <laughs> I've heard you do so many different voices, Shirley. You always seem to me to be six girls rolled into one. What a roll. <laughs> Gee, six girls at once. Wouldn't my mother have been famous if all six of me had been born separately? Famous and busy. <laughs> six tuplets. What a boost for Brooklyn. Uh, I beg to differ, Mr. Tremaine, which I am not a native of Brooklyn, but of Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> Oh, harm me. Granted, as soon as asked, which I am sure you are entitled. Even though I'm an ardent fan of Brooklyn, the point is that I must observe that upon this occasion I am not in a Brooklyn mood. Which mood are you in? Tonight, ma chérie, I am feel so very French. I am think of the left bank, of the Gowanus Canal. I am, how you say in English, in the grove. <laughs> I am reminded of a little nightclub, intimate and simple, like a phone booth. <laughs> With a dance floor and a three-piece band. No formality, no air. <laughs> I see there seated at the piano the glamorous continental singer, Fouffet. It is the hour of the midnight show, which she always likes. It is the hour of supper. That she loves. <laughs> the lights grow dim. She's a dream of beauty, except for one tiny bald spot. <laughs> 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 the performance she begins. The magic spell begins. The deathly hush begins. Everything begins but the begin. <laughs> this does not stop her. She starts. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Parlez-vous, François? <laughs> that means speaky, basic French. <laughs> Alors, now Fouffet, she play for you. Fouffet, she sing for you. And if you are very, very, very good as an uncle, Fouffet, she foo for you. Hooray! <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, merci beaucoup, merci bien, merci d'autres. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, je vous aime beaucoup. Je ne sais pas Kalamazoo. <laughs> So here I am again with this tired French routine. If the suckers only knew what I was thinking. Oh, there's that noisy debut tramp again at a front table. How about that dress? Looks like the one she came out in last season. She moves around very much. She'll be coming out of this one. <laughs> How about those dopes paying a ten-buck cover charge? Doesn't even cover the spots on the tablecloth. All because I'm a Jan Tootsie. <laughs> Jan Tootsie. That's the French word for a squirt with no voice. <laughs> oh, and it's so tight. All right, I asked for something that'd make me look breathless, but I still would like to breathe. <laughs> oh, those noisy waiters. Well, here's where I kill the customers with that lullaby. <laughs> There is another program that you were rather well identified with Thin in man? my mind. That's exactly right. The mm -hmm. Thin Man. You and uh, Claudia Morgan. Claudia Morgan, lovely girl. One of the most unique and delightful voices in all of mm -hmm. radio. Daughter of Ralph Morgan, the famous theater and motion picture actor, and niece of Frank Morgan, mm -hmm. even more famous. Yeah, I did The Thin Man for about five years. Opposite the Bob Crosby Show. The Adventures of the Thin Man took to the air on CBS. Based on the 1934 film starring William Powell and Myrna Loy, both Les Tremaine and Les Damon at times co-starred with Claudia Morgan as Nick and Nora Charles. Nick Charles was a retired private eye who just couldn't stay away from murder. The Thin Man gave its listeners all the censor would allow. 
Morgan cooed invitingly. She mouthed long, drawn-out kisses and kidded Nicky Darling about his outlandish pajamas. One critic strongly objected to the oohs and ahs and mmms during kisses. But as feminine and cozy as Claudia Morgan played Nora, life noted that she can step across pools of blood with all the calm delicacy of a lady-in-waiting. Parker Fennelly played Sheriff Ebenezer Williams. Yeah. But now, you said, you said you were in a radio program in 1929, yeah. and it was my impression that commercial radio didn't really begin until 27 or 28. So you must have really been there at the... Uh, well, at the I only know North. we came out here in either 29 or 30, I'm not quite sure. And I had been doing some radio before that. So I think I started in New York in about 29. You talk about material, and I'm wondering, you said you did some writing for Kate Smith. Yeah. In terms of the success of a radio program, what weight would you place on the comedy writers or the, the material in terms of that versus the delivery? Or about 75%, I think. I think so. And that's why, well, it used to be, I don't know that it is now, but some of the people who would write, I know about rural things more than I did about city things. The rating for this episode was 16.1. Roughly 12 million people tuned in. Coasties, or host posties, or that is roast coasties, I mean toast posties, present, or present. Hey, get that name right, my confused friend. It's post toasties. Post toasties. Crisp, delicious post toasties present the adventures of the Thin Man, starring Claudia Morgan and Les Damon. A basic seven food with whole grain nourishment, post toasties. find our old friend, Sheriff Ebenezer Williams, ringing the doorbell of Nick and Nora Charles' apartment. Thank you, darling. I didn't expect... Oh, Ev Williams. Howdy, Nori. Ev, darling, come in. Hello. Where's Essie? Oh, she's coming on a later train. And don't let Essie hear you call me darling. <laughs> Everybody's a darling tonight, Ev. This is going to be the most wonderful anniversary Nicky and I ever had. If he remembers about it, the big goon. Well, did he forget? He didn't mention a word about it all day. Oh, well, I reckon he's trying to tease you. You look lovely, Ev. Yeah, I got on my best bib and tucker. I save these clothes for funerals and weddings. You look mighty spruce yourself, Nori. Do you really think so, Ev? I uh, got this evening gown especially for tonight. Yeah. Uh, do you like it? You seem to fill it out fine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that must be Nicky now. Eb, don't you remind him that this is our anniversary. I want to see if he forgot. What'll he do if he has? Well, I can't make up my mind. Shall I blow his brains out or slit his throat? Oh, slit his throat. Because if you try to blow his brains out, you might miss the target. He'd be in so small. Nicky, darling. Hello, baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <sighs> um... Didn't, um, you forget something, dear? No, darling. Here's a half pound of butter you asked me to bring home. Oh. When I promised the grocer I'd marry his daughter, he let me have it. Oh, hello, Ev. Howdy, Nick. Oh, well, awfully nice to see you again. What brought you to town? Steam cars. Oh, <laughs> I thought there was something up. Well, there is. What? Oh, I come in to see a fellow's throat slid. Oh, whose? Friend of mine. Oh. Well, Nora and I haven't seen an interesting throat slitting in a long time. Can we come along? Yes, be glad to have you. Hey, Nora, what are you all dressed up for? And Ev, you're all dolled up, too. Why? For the funeral of the fellow that's going to get his throat slit. Oh, <laughs> well, I guess I'd better change. I'll see you in a minute. Oh, oh, Ev, he completely forgot. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> see if that package really has got butter into it. Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, Ev, huh? it is butter. Well, what you crying <laughs> for? Butter has its pints. Oh. That big goon. He'll see if I'll ever marry him again. Oh, why do I love a husband I hate so much? Oh, just a minute. Oh, 
Uh, Mrs. Charles? Yes. Uh, I'm yes. Mr. Squiller of Squiller Incorporated. Oh. Flowers for the dead, dying, and married. Oh. Where shall I put this? Oh, there's the flowers. Oh, over there. <laughs> Very well. Uh, uh, do you have a cold? No, I'm allergic to blossoms. Uh. <laughs> Uh, Miss Charles. Yes. May I extend my deepest and heartfelt condolences on this uh, 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 occasion? Oh, well, well, thank you. I... What did you say? I saw you crying when I came in. Perhaps he's happier in another world. Mm -hmm. Who can tell? My deepest sympathies, madam. My heart bleeds for you. You'll get my bill in the morning. Uh, oh. Goodbye. Allergy in a country churchyard. Look at that bunch of poses he said. Mm. Wonder if I'm celebrating an anniversary or winning a horse race. Let's see what the ribbon says. <gasps> oh, darling, how do you like the flowers? Aren't they lovely? Beautiful, dear. I'm just mad about the inscription. Rest in peace. Huh? So appropriate for an anniversary. What are you talking about? That uh, there ribbon, Nick. Couldn't they get you one that said success? Yeah, let me see. <laughs> Lilies, this is a funeral bower. Where are the jewels? What jewels, dear? I bought a necklace and told him to send it with the flowers. You expect me to believe that? But I did. You forgot our anniversary entirely. Oh, darling, don't you see? I did send you flowers. They were delivered here by mistake. But I bought a gift for you, too. You're just making that up. You don't love me anymore. But I do love you. You hear that, Eddie? He's shouting at me now. Oh, I'm going back to the flower shop and find out what happened. You mean you're running out to buy me something? Oh, I know all your little tricks. All right, all right. You can come along, and you can come too, Eb, as a witness. Maybe that funeral wreath isn't so inappropriate for our wrecked marriage. Rest in peace. Oh, Eb. <laughs> oh, please, don't scream at me so. I, I can't bear it, Mr. Charles. <laughs> it drives me mad. Gesundheit. Oh, look, Mr. Squiller, all I want to know is who got the necklace I left with you. If he left any necklace. Which I'm beginning to doubt. <laughs> Don't confuse me so, please. I'm suffering acutely from allergies. I'm sneezing my brains out. I, I hardly know what I'm doing anymore. All right, look, I'll make it simple. I got a funeral wreath. Now, you must have delivered my flowers and the jewelry to somebody else. Do you suppose that's what I did? Yes, I do. Probably you sent it to the person who was supposed to get the funeral wreath. Why, of course, I remember now. How perfectly idiotic of me. Yes, well, where did you send my jewels and the flowers? Uh, let me see. Now, oh, here's, here's the card. Mrs. Gwen Gray Gilroy, 1408 East 86th Street. Gwen Gray Gilroy? Nikki, hmm? isn't she that showgirl who threatened to commit suicide when you married me? Which one do you mean, dear? <laughs> the one you nicknamed Strikeout because she had so many curves. Oh. <laughs> She called you Sugar Man. Oh, I'm sure it's not the same person. She married a millionaire named Gilroy. I read it in the papers. Nick, have you been sending her flowers and jewelry? Oh, look, what am I getting into here? No, this is just a simple mix-up. Probably due to Mr. Squiller's allergy. Uh, I'm so sorry all this happened. My nose is just driving me crazy. Uh, why don't you quit the flower business if you're allergic to flowers? Uh, well, how can I quit when I'm losing money? It's a vicious circle, starting from my nose and ending with my bank account. Believe me, when I think of my troubles, I, I could weep. Oh. Come, Nicky. We're going to Mrs. Gilroy's. And if what I suspect is true, you're going to be dead before morning. Oh, will he really, Mrs. Charles? Yeah, you can depend upon it, Mr. Squiller. In that case, remember where to buy your flowers for the funeral, Mrs. Charles. Just a moment. Why, Sugar Man. Oh, strike out. So, it is her. Sugar Man, you found out about poor Virgil dying and you came back to me. Uh, no, not exactly strike out, uh, this is my wife, Nora. Oh, how do you do? Uh, not as well as you seem to be doing. And this is my friend, Sheriff Ebenezer Williams. Howdy, straight out. Uh, does that coffin contain the remains of your late spouse? Yes. <laughs> now, look, Gwen. There's been a kind of mix-up. Did Mr. Squiller deliver some flowers to you? Yes, Nicky. They're at the head of the casket. Why? Was there a package with them? Well, I don't know. I wasn't here when they arrived. Let's take a look, Nick. Maybe it's with the flowers. Yes, come on. How did he work out as a husband, Nora? Uh, not uh, 
badly. Don't seem to be here, Nick. I'll open the casket, Ed. Maybe that idiotic florist put it in there. Uh, maybe he was playing treasure hunter. Uh, uh. Hey, look. The casket's empty. Uh, Godfrey, nobody home. What are you talking about? Like your husband's body isn't here. The casket's empty. Virgil gone? Say, that jerk can't do this to me. <laughs> Dad and Nick didn't send that package by post. Toasties, Ted. Huh? Whenever you say post, follow up quick with toasties. Post toasties. You know, delicious, crisper cornflakes. Oh, yeah, but I'm talking about a package. Large or small. You know, Ted, post toasties come in different size packages. Well, sure they do. And my friend, when you always buy the largest package instead of the smallest size, you save up to 17 cents on every dollar spent for post toasties. Now, that's something you can count on, a basic saving. Hey, did you say basic seven? Mm-mm. But, you know, uh, post-toasties are a basic seven food, one type of food our government urges us to eat for wartime strength and fitness. Mm-hmm. Post-toasties are a swell source of quick energy with whole grain nourishment, including iron, niacin, vitamin B1. Well, what do you know? I've been eating post-toasties just because they taste so good. Well, you keep right on, my friend. Enjoy that good ripe corn flavor, that toasty crispness, that valuable whole grain nourishment. Mm-hmm. Enjoy Post Toasties. A delicious, nourishing, crisper basic seven food. Post Toasties. And now, back to the night's nice adventure of the Thin Man. Mrs. Gwen Gray Gilroy, known to Nick and Nora as Strikeout, has just found that her husband's body is not in the coffin. We heard her say, Virgil gone? Say, that jerk can't do this to me. Maybe he stole the necklace and beat it. He couldn't. He was dead. Are you sure of that, Gwen? Sure, certainly. I saw him croak with my own eyes. Well, somebody stole that necklace. Somebody stole my husband's body. I reckon there's a crook around here, by Godfrey. Well, come on, Eb. We're going to turn this place inside out. I'm sure it's a... Say, here's the body. Where? Behind the sofa. Uh, you must have misplaced it, strikeout. Huh. Well, how did it get there? I reckon he was just hiding to scare us. Say, strikeout. Is that a picture of the deceased? Yes. And he didn't die of disease. Heart attack, the doctor said. Looky, Nick. That there ain't a picture of the corpse. Let me see. Oh. Gwen, is that Virgil? No, it's somebody else. Where'd you get him, Gwen? I don't know. Oh, this is awful. Hey, wait a minute. I found something here. What is it, Nick? Another cadaver? No. It's a bill from the luxury deluxe hotel in this fellow's pocket. It's a dollar and 25 cents. For a week's board. Reasonable. Yes. This hotel's down in the Bowery. Sugar man, won't you find poor Virgil's body for me? The funeral's all arranged and I have a lovely black dress already. Never mind about that body, Nick. You'd better find that necklace. If there was one stolen. Uh, Nick, do you think the same crook that stole the body stole the necklace? You've got something there, Ed. We're going to the Luxury Deluxe Hotel right now. Oh, this is awful. This is terrible. No, 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 no. no. Don't take it too hard, strike out. Your husband had to go sometime. That's not why I'm crying. Suppose Virgil is alive. I won't collect a penny. Oh, he's just got to be dead. Good evening, friends. Welcome to the Luxury Deluxe Hotel. No opium smoking and no murder allowed. Oh, a respectable gerent. I thought we was coming to one of these here low dives. Awful disappointing. Well, friends, would you like a room with a window or just a room? Uh, not exactly. You see... Here, my friend. Where'd you get my watch? Oh, that's just to show how honest we are. Don't you recognize me, Nicky? Oh, Dippy Danny, the pickpocket. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, I decided to go straight for the duration... My contribution to the war effort. <laughs> Danny, this is my wife, Nora. Oh, how do you do? Huh. Are you a very experienced pickpocket, Mr. Dippy? No, I've had my hands in some of the most well-greased pockets in this country. Uh, here's your change, please. Oh. oh, thank you. And this is my old friend, Ed Williams. Howdy, Dippy. Hello, son. Here's your wallet. Mr. Dippy looks... So... Good for you. How do you do it? I'll show you later if you want to know. Uh, hey. How you got in that sheet over your shoulder, son? All right, Ed. Put him down there and uncover him. Okay, baby, dokey. Easy, does it. Ah. You recognize him, Danny? Kind of stiff, huh? 
Yeah, I know him. Who is he? A fellow named Joe Jones. Died here three days ago. Oh, we found him in a swanky apartment uptown. How'd he get there? Well, it's kind of a queer story. A dame come in and wanted a dead body. What? Yeah. She wanted to rent one. I told her I had one, so I rented them to her for two bucks. Is, is renting bodies part of your regular line of business here? No, but I don't mind picking up a little spare change now and then. A fellow needs it, you know, what with taxes. Yeah, sure. Well, what else do you know about this woman? Well, she rented a room here. It's right down the hall. Uh, you want to see it? Yes, I certainly do. Uh, what's her name? Mrs. John Smith, she says. Uh, you think she was lying, Nick? What does she look like? I couldn't see. She was wearing a black veil. Uh, here's the room. Oh, it looks like an ideal honeymoon suite for a couple of zombies. <laughs> oh, look, Nick. Well, say, what do you know? That's the body of Strikeout's husband. Yes, and he's been struck out all right. But good. Here, look at the eyes, Ed. He's been poisoned. Murdered by Godfrey. I knew it. Can't we ever have an anniversary without a murder? Nora, you and Ev go home. There's some checking up I want to do. I'll be there in an hour. All right, Nick. I'll be glad to get out of this terrible place. Wait a minute. Did you say he was poisoned, Nick? Yes, Danny. Why? He should have known better. It's against the rules of the hotel. Uh... The only way we'll find out who stole that necklace is by solving this murder. I'd like to have a nice, cozy talk with Strikeout. Oh, no, you don't. Not on my wedding anniversary. But, uh... Well, Ed, yeah. you think you can find out what I want to know from Strikeout? Sure thing. You know how I handle women, Nick. <laughs> All right, Ed. You get her to tell you everything she can about Bart and Bellows. Yeah. She's been seen around with him. Find out if she's got a black veil and find out just what happened when her husband died. All right, I'll go right now. Then be careful, Ed. Strikeout can be dangerous when she's cornered. I'll keep her away from corners, then. See you later, Nick. Bye. Who are you calling, Nick? Barton Bellows, maybe. Oh. Hello, Mr. Bellows' residence. Oh, uh, are you Mr. Bellows' maid? Yeah. Are you happy working for Mr. Bellows? Well, I don't know. Why? Well, my name's Nick Charles. Uh, maybe I can offer you a better job. Do you like it there? Well, Mr. Bellows ain't married, so we don't have a wife who'll let me wear a fur coat like in the last job I had. Oh, but... Well, my wife would let you wear hers. Can I speak to your wife? Why, sure. No. Hmm? Get her to quit her job right now. Not only is it necessary, but we can also get a maid. Oh. Hello? Your husband says I can wear your fur coat if I wait for you. Well, of course. What kind of a coat do you got? Persian lamb. Oh, Persian lamb. I can get lots of jobs with a Persian lamb coat. Oh, but I, I also have a mink coat. Oh, mink? Uh -huh. That's more like it. How much will you pay? Well, how much do you get? $30 a week. I'll give you 40 Two nights off a week, and can I use the telephone when I want? Yes. Also, can I have my boyfriend in Saturday night? Yes, of course. That's the kind of a job I want. Then you must quit right now and come over here. The address is 409 Park Drive. Okay, I'll be there right away. Uh, I, uh, I hope you don't think it's odd, my stealing you from Mr. Bellows over the phone this way. Oh, no. That's how he got me. It's wonderful being a maid these days, Mrs. Charles. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, we got a maid. So now what? So now, Nora, you're going to find out a few things about Barton Bellows for me. You are going to be a Swedish maid applying for a job. Oh, you mean... A vain girl who scrubs clean like anything by Jumpen Himmelich. Good evening. Are you Mr. Bellows? Yes. A vain expert Swedish maid, cook, housekeeper, nurse, a laundress, and dishwasher. A have used to quit a job and told my madam to go to. <clears throat> Um, maybe you have a job for me? Do I have a job for you? Come right in. You were sent from heaven. No, I come from Brooklyn. I mean, my maid just quit. I need someone to take care of my house. I'll pay you anything you want. Oh, is that picture of your wife? Well, no, not exactly. This beautiful woman, she writes, to Barton, the one and only in my life, all my love, Gwen. <laughs> 
If she's not your wife, why does she love you? Well, she's a kind of a friend of mine. I'm not married. Oh, not married? I am not married, too. Well, I hope you'll like this job. I'll do anything you want to make you happy. Will you marry me? Well, uh, no. I but... think I go home. Uh, no, no, please. Hey, I mean, I'll be nice to you. That won't be hard. You're uh, very pretty. You think so? Yeah. Oh, uh, I think maybe I say. Ah, look at this drawer. So messy. Full of old letters. Oh, what are you doing there? They must see if you pay your bill. It don't work for a man who does not pay his bill. Ah, here is interesting letters. Dearest Barton, I don't think poor Virgil can live very much longer. The old goat is due to kick the bucket soon, and we can get yeah, married. Yeah, give me that. It is from that Gwen. Who? Oh, you want to marry her? Well, that's none of your business. Their A work, everything is my business. Aha. You have a little bottle here, a little bottle of pills. I wonder what they are. Yes, don't open that. Please take your hands off me or I smack your face. Uh, here is your bottle of pills. I don't think they would be so good for me anyway. I, I think you'd better leave. I'm afraid I can't use leave. them. Leave? You bet by him and he leave. They will not work such a filthy place. Look at these dishes. <laughs> Get out of here. Oh, you insult me. A crit. Look at his bar. Filthy. Ye are a beast. Good night. But, Eddie, are you sure he was poisoned? Yeah, yeah. Now, you better tell me all you know about it, Strike Out. This is murder. You can go to jail for that, by Godfrey. Have you told the police yet? No. Don't tell them, Eddie. I'm sure they'll suspect me. You will be a nice little boy and not mention a word about it. Well, it ain't easy to keep a thing like this secret. I know, but won't you do this for poor little me? If you kept a thing like... Don't you misplaced your arm, Strike Out? Oh, don't misunderstand, Debbie. I'm just holding you because I'm frightened. No. You're just like my daddy. You know what he used to do when I was frightened? Don't knock my derby off. What? He used to hold me in his arms like this and then kiss me. Like this? Your daddy done that. Mm -hmm. Sweet papa. You're sweet too, Abby. You won't call the police. Will you, daddy? Uh, well, I reckon I'll think about it. Uh, where's your clothes closet, Strike Out? There. Why? Uh, I just want to take a look. You wear this black veil very much? What do you want with that veil? Hello, darling. I... Oh, I see you have company. Barton, I didn't hear you come in. Ed, this is Barton Bellows. Howdy, Barton. Hello. When I've got to talk to you. And i got to see you, too. They found Virgil's body. I'll open it. Oh, hello, Ed. Why, Nori and Nick. Come in, come in. Ed, uh, your lipstick smeared. <laughs> I reckon i got that comforting strike out here. Sugar man, you won't let him call the police, will you? Just wait a day until I see my lawyer. Strike out, is that man Barton Bellows? That's him. The Swedish maid. Say, what is this all about? You'll find out in a minute. Mr. Bellows, you better sit down. Sugar man, what are you going to do? Strike out, who was here on the night that your husband got killed? Just Barton and me and Virgil. Why? When did he die? About nine o'clock. We had brandy in this very room. Then Virgil stood up and collapsed. What did he do with the body? Barton put a sheet over him. I was hysterical, so Barton gave me a sedative, and I went to bed. I see. Ed, hmm. did you find anything here? Yeah, this black veil, Nick. Just like the time that your pal Dipper see. Nicky, sugar man, what's the veil got to do with all this? Gwen, the person who murdered your husband tried a very slick trick. The killer obtained the body of a man who died naturally and put it under that sheet to deceive the examining doctor. Your husband's body was hidden in the luxury deluxe hotel in the bar inn. It was hidden there by a woman who wore a black veil, Gwen. The killer had only one problem. The bodies had to be exchanged again. The poison man's body would have been buried, and nobody would even know your husband was murdered, Gwen. Isn't he brilliant? Only one thing went wrong with this almost perfect murder, Gwen. The killer planned to change the bodies tonight. But after the corpse of the Bowery derelict was removed from the coffin, there was an interruption. Flowers arrived. The flowers that were sent here by mistake. So the killer quickly hid the corpse behind the sofa. Well, how do you know that? I checked with Mr. Squiller, the florist. 
He heard something being moved about just before he came in. Now, whoever moved that corpse is the killer. Now, Gwen, the elevator boy said you left word when you went out to let Mr. Squiller in with the building's pass key. That sounds like a good alibi, but can you prove you were out of the house at that time, Gwen? You're not going to get away with this. Grab it, Nick. She's going for that drawer. I got those Get up. Gun by God, please. Stand back, all of you. First one who makes a move to touch you, he's going to get killed. I'm getting out of here. I... Oh, the light! Oh, turn off the light! Nick, don't let her get away! No, let go! Don't! Don't! Yep, light a match. Okay. Nora, turn on that switch. That one over there. All right. Ed, take this gun and cover Bellows. Do the kill if he tries anything. Are you crazy? She was trapped and she committed suicide. The gun's still in her hand. She shot herself. Maybe she did. No, baby, it's just a flesh wound. She'll be okay. Phone the police and tell them to send an ambulance. All right. Fellows, you're under arrest for murder. You don't know what you're talking about. Her attempt to kill herself proves she's guilty. You see Gwen's wristwatch? The crystal doesn't get crushed when you try to commit suicide. It got crushed when you grabbed her arm in the dark and twisted it and turned the gun on her. You murdered her husband. Nor got one of the poison pills you used when she went to your apartment. You'll never be able to prove this. I got proof already, pal. For instance, you're the only one that would be familiar enough with this room to know where the light switch is. And what's more, you left fingerprints all over that room at the Hotel Luxury Deluxe when you come down there in the dress and clothes that you stole from Gwen. Yes, what else have I done? You stole your necklace, Nick. Yeah, here it is. Where'd you get that? Out of your pocket. Why, oh, yeah, but I didn't know you were a pickpocket. Oh, uh, I got Danny the Dipper to show me how to do it. <laughs> Well, that about clinches it, Bellows. That proves you were here when the flowers arrived. You murdered Virgil Gilroy because you wanted to marry Strikeout after she inherited his dough. And stop shivering, Bellows. You'll be warmed up soon enough. When you pull the covers up, darling, it gets chilly. Okay. Hey, is that better? Mm-hmm. What made Barton Bellows steal the necklace? Well, he got cold feet when he was interrupted by Squiller. He figured it would come in handy if he had to clear out in a hurry and needed money first. Hmm. But why'd Strikeout pull that gun? Well, she thought she was being framed and she lost her head. Hey, does that clear up everything? Mm-hmm. Darling, it was a lovely anniversary. Even if we did have to celebrate rather late. Uh-huh. Should we go to sleep, dear? No. Let's stay up and remember old times. That's what people should do on anniversary. Oh, but no, I want to sleep. You didn't feel that way on our wedding night. No. Mm. You're getting old, Nikki. Who's getting old? <laughs> I can stay awake forever if I want to. Me getting old? <laughs> it's ridiculous. I can stay up all night for a week if I want to. I just... You want to know. And you're fibbing. You can't. Okay, I'll show you. Let's talk about anything you want to, as long as you want to. Nikki, do you remember what you said when I first met you? Mm hmm. What did you say? Well, Nikki. Nikki, are you sleeping? Very good. Mm-hmm. Good night, Nikki, darling. Now, when that sleepy pair wake up in the morning, they'll be ready for breakfast. So I'll just slip out the kitchen and see what's there. Mm-hmm. The icebox, there's cream, milk, pears. Oh, yeah, there it is, right up there on the pantry shelf. Post Toasties, all the makings for a swell breakfast dish. Crisp Post Toasties with juicy, ripe sliced pears on top and rich milk overall. Mm, boy, these delicious cornflakes taste so good and stay so crisp. Why, there's a wake-up smile in every tempting spoonful. Yes, and Post Toasties are a swell source of quick food energy and valuable nourishment. Whole grain nourishment, including iron, niacin. Vitamin B1. Mm-hmm. Post toasties are one type of cereal nutritionist day we should be sure and eat every morning. Yes, a breakfast including fruit, milk, toast, a beverage, and a generous helping of post toasties is a nourishing, adequate breakfast. One that'll help prevent mid morning fatigue, help promote good spirits and real working efficiency. So keep that in mind, won't you? And tomorrow, well, every morning, help yourself to get off to a good start with a really good breakfast, including post toasties. <laughs> 
a delicious, crisper, basic seven food. Mm-hmm. Post Toasty. Tune in next week to radio's most popular mystery comedy, The Adventures of the Thin Man, brought to you by Chris Post Toasty, the basic seven food. Listen next week when Nick and Nora investigate the stolen jewelry racket and discover it's a short step from hot rhinestones to cold tombstones.